Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Demon Land podcast. My name is Andy, and joining me once again, Grape Viney. Good evening, Grape Viney. How are you? Oh, I'm excellent, Andy. Couldn't be better. Oh, excellent. And uh, joining us once again, uh, our friend from Twitter, uh, at Demon Blog, Super Mercado. Good evening. How are you? Gentlemen, I'm on cloud nine. It's it's lovely to talk to you at the high water mark of the uh, post finals <laughs> era, and hopefully the pre finals era as well. Well, it was an absolute uh, pleasure of a weekend to be a, a Melbourne Football Club supporter and a Casey Demons uh, f- supporter as well. Uh, we had a combined uh, total of 215 points uh, of victory. Um, and I learnt that stat. I learnt a stat from you, Super Mercado, today or yesterday. With that was our biggest, uh, the first time uh, two Melbourne teams, and we'll call Casey a Melbourne team, uh, having hundred point victories in the same week. Yes, well, we haven't uh, we haven't had too many hundred point victories over the uh, over the years. So yes, that was the first time we've ever we've ever doubled down on two hundred point wins in a week. It's fantastic. Um, uh, now, I was thinking, is it the best combined, this is a, a stat you'll have to <laughs> dig up one day, uh, best combined, even including the under-19s, uh, 215 points is going to be difficult well, to top. A, a lot of the 100-point wins either came before the under-19s existed or after they were uh, given the boot, <laughs> or in a final in the case of that great uh, North Melbourne massacre of 87, so... Leave it with me. There's there's not a large uh, there's not a large number to choose from. I'm just having a look at the list here. We've got a 113 against Richmond in 64, 108 against North in 72, 105 against South Melbourne in 1971. That'd be the only three where where we're all three grades. So so how many at the same time. how many times have we won by 100 points just in the seniors? That is 15 now. Okay, so really not a not a lot. So. Uh, uh, our last hundred point win was in two thousand and four, and then our the la- the next largest one uh, of was nineteen ninety three. I can't believe it's been so long in between uh, drinks. A very memorable day for me, as uh, many people have probably heard. I've told this story so many times. At three quarter time of that game, I went put my hand up to point at something in the bottom deck of the Ponsford stand, and a bird <laughs> delivered right on the <laughs> finger that I was pointing with. Some... Um, but I think we were about 85 points up at the time. So I wasn't too too stressed. And then we uh, powered away to a 121-point win in the last quarter, which cheered me up even more. Well, it's a sign of good luck, isn't it, if a bird poos on you? Well, I've, I've had a few over the years where it hasn't turned out to be good luck. <laughs> but that was certainly, that was the first ever time I was assassinated from the skies at the MCG, <laughs> aged 12 years old. Uh, good day that day, not, not so good some of the other days. No, um, if anyone would like to join us uh, tonight and talk about anything that we're going to talk about, and we'll probably mostly be talking about the the game uh, we witnessed on the weekend, uh, you can either join us in the live chat room, which we've got on uh, demonland.com slash podcast. Um, You can give us a call, 03-9016-3666, or you can Skype us on at demonland31. Um, gentlemen, uh, Great Viney, I'll go to you. Um, who impressed you the most uh, in this uh, victory? Uh, I th- it's hard to go past Jake um, Melksham. Um, I thought he was great on the day, seeing it live, um, obviously kicking a career-best five goals. But I, when I watched the replay last night, I saw a whole lot more that I hadn't seen live. Um, and thought he was just sensational. And you look at his numbers, uh, 21 touches, 14 of them were contested. Wow. Um, which you sort of wouldn't normally think for a player kicking that many goals. He kicked goals. He set them up. I think he had 15 score involvements and four goal assists. Um, a disposal efficiency percentage of 85.7, which is, uh, which is right up there. And uh, apparently he... Got some AFL player ranking, which only Stevie J and Gary Ablett have um, managed to get previously. So, so I saw uh, there was I saw an that. article about that on the AFL website. Yeah, um, so I saw that. Uh, what were they? How do they calculate that? Um, I don't know. I didn't read too much into it. I thought it was funny that the video that accompanied that piece 
um, was of his one error for the day. Um, <laughs> and it, and so it, took off it was five. a video of a hand pass that went to a Carlton player. So why they thought uh, they needed to highlight that particular possession, I'm not too sure. But uh, he was outstanding. So I thought, uh, yeah, I, I thought the milk was BOG. Well, while we're talking about um, while we're talking about the milk, um, the AFL team of the week, um, you know, they they do an AFL team of the week each week. I think Kane Corns is responsible uh, for it this year. Um, now he wrote an interesting. Uh, he writes a write up about uh, everyone, um, and he his write up about um, Melksham was uh, quite. Funny. I'm not sure if any of you saw that, and I'm just trying to pull it up now. And of course, the AFL site hasn't updated, so they don't have the latest one there. But I'm going to find. I'm finding it now on uh, on Demonland. Um, but yeah, it was quite interesting what he says. He said something about him that is the most improved player, which is funny because he's so old. And that's all he said about him. Um, and I just thought that was just a strange thing to, to say about him. Um, he's not that old, is he? Well, is he he's his mid-20s, isn't he? 25? Well, I guess in uh, AFL terms, that is ancient, um, mm. according to um, to Kane Corns. But um, there were... F- not exactly a new, new phenomenon here. Uh, obviously, this was a career best, and his game against Richmond, I think, was a previous career best. But the whole second half of last year, he was kicking goals. Yep. Um, pretty constant. I think he kicked a goal in every game for about the last 11 or 12 games of the year. So yeah, I guess it's yep. one of those things that you, uh, when you're an outsider and you're not taking as much um, forensic notice of what's going on, that that's where you can miss it until he comes out and rips out, you know, an absolute great game. I'm um, not sure whether on the vibe it felt like one of the best games of the last five years, but it was certainly a, a it was one of those ones, even to the naked eye without looking at statistics, just watching him play, you just thought this guy is playing one of the greatest games of his life. And then, obviously, these uh, statistics came out to suggest that it was one of the, the greatest games. I think he lost to, he lost to Franklin. Kicking 13 was the, was the best one of the time they've measured it. And Steve Johnson in a 186 was about the second <laughs> one, and this was about the third or fourth. So it was remarkable to, to rank that highly. But who knows how these uh, numbers are actually put together. Well, well, the actual quote was, one of the most improved players in the comp- competition is Jake Milksham, which is surprising because he's not young anymore. Um, <laughs> oh, I, won't, I won't bag um, uh, Kane Corns too much because he did tip us to finish first this year. So, um, Fested interest. Yes, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, we, him and Hutto. Him and Hutto were the two that, uh, that picked us to win the flag. I always thought Hutto was a sensible man, and maybe he's turning out to be one. <laughs> so we, we had we had uh, we had five players in the AFL team of the week this week. Um, Jake Lever uh, on the halfback, what a sensational uh, game he played, and and you know you know he's proven his his trajectory over the last few weeks has been amazing. He's starting to pr- prove those uh, doubters at the start of the year very wrong. Uh, amazing statistics, 27 possessions. Um, his intercept, I'm not sure, did it, anyone got the intercept uh, intercepts stats? I think it was 13 or something like that. He's just been, he's just, was amazing. Some of his marking is beautiful. Uh, that was one out on the outer wing or the outer half forward flank. Um, where he sort of floated across the front of a contest and uh, just, yeah, um, uh, it looked like poetry, basically. Um, A lovely high mark and uh, his reading of the play sensational. Look, there wasn't uh, wasn't much opposition for him. The fact that Kurnow was out assisted, so he had a day out um, and could basically do as he pleased, but he took advantage of it, absolutely. Not to mention their uh, constant kicking down the down the line that that never worked, and they just kept going back to it. I actually thought it was it was quite like if you'd watched if you'd put Melbourne twenty thirteen up against Melbourne twenty eighteen. That was kind of like what it was, what mm. we were watching. They were a side that you know they had your Patrick Cripps is your Nathan Jones, your one guy trying to hold everyone, <laughs> yeah. you know, up on his own. You had your Cruiser as your Jamar of that era. 
and then they just had their their bottom level was just terrible. I I, I guess they a lot of them are young, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Who cares about Carlton? But it was really like watching us the way we used to. For a quarter, we could hold these teams, and then we'd just get burnt to pieces. Um, so it's amazing just to be on the, finally on the other side of that. You know what? I'm not buying the that they're young. Uh, someone produced some statistics uh, earlier in the week showing that uh, in terms of age, um, we match up pretty well. We're just as young as they are. So I guess uh, they've got a lot of they've got your your Kate Simpsons and people like that at the top end, and then they've got the the bottom a lot at the bottom end. But um, yeah, exactly. Like you know, just because they're young doesn't mean they're going to get better. Yeah. Um, it was like an under 11s game at times. We just had a wall of players across half back, uh, particularly in the, particularly in the second half, and they were just kicking it straight to us every single time. It was, it was they were shambles. No, no idea what they were doing going forward. Um, and again, just, it was very reminiscent of things I've seen in the past. It's very nice to for the shoe to be on the other fo- foot for at once. Last. Um, yeah, just uh, sensational. Um, what was great was actually watching footy classified last night and watching Chris Judd, who I can't stand, squirm in his seat um, <laughs> as he tried to uh, tried to explain what had happened. And funnily enough, I actually saw Chris Judd at Richmond Station after the game um, and was surprised that he uh, takes public transport yeah, I was say, uh, to he, the game. Does he not um, have a chauffeur? Standing there in his suit. <laughs> As a former environmental ambassador for the uh, Vizzy Corporations, <laughs> we, we know he's got a, a long-standing interest in environmental issues. <laughs> I, I'd have thought he'd be happy as a uh, childhood Melbourne fan. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Um, uh, I was very impressed this week, and I think he's uh, improving every week. Uh, James Harms, uh, what did you guys think? Yeah, I'd agree. Like I thought he was serviceable. He probably had a. He wasn't as as um, hot as he was the week before against Gold Coast. But I think that's what we need. We need players like that that are would be considered the bottom bracket of players that you can rely on to play good games. Um, and I think he really does play his role well. Um, probably one of those players that he's going to be in and out before the end of the year. Um, but he definitely offers something. Um, and absolutely 100% offer something as a great depth option um, for the rest of the season. And you can't talk about James Harms without pairing him up with his buddy, which is A and B. Well, he was Everyone sort of seems to seems to have them together, that they're both at the same sort of level, role players um, can step up. And A and B finally... Um, Finally, sort of, uh, you know, got back on the board and got it all together on the weekend and was able to get a, a few goals and uh, good on him because I think uh, you could see that uh, he had the black armband on. Uh, his grandfather passed away the day before the game, so um, uh, well done to Nibbler on uh, on a good game um, on what would have been a difficult weekend for him. Do you think? And I think. That's yeah. where your um you you people can write off the fact that we played you know probably four dud teams in a row, but it's the it's the players like that. And three weeks ago, he looked like he had absolutely no confidence whatsoever, but now he's had the opportunity to get the confidence up with two decent performances in a row, one excellent performance in a row on the weekend, and hopefully that flows into playing the the better teams over the next few weeks. Do you think the fact I, I thought perhaps we were playing him out of position in the first uh, first part of the year, and I think he's more suited to a to a forward uh, role, uh, and we've seen him kick goals in the last couple of weeks, rather than playing in the middle. Rather than playing in the middle, I think we were, yeah. were sort of well, playing him with most more in the, yeah. And now Brayshaw going into the middle, um, you'd sort of hope that he doesn't need to go in there again. Because uh, I, I agree, his, uh, his best foot is played up at half forward, where there's very stiff competition for spots in that forward line. So you've got to be on your toes. And, and I seem to remember last year there was some stat about him being like a, a really high pressure player. Now, I don't know, again, it's like the AFL player ratings. Who knows how they define a pressure player? But that's exactly what we can do with um, sort of up forward, half forward line. Because there is a lot of times where the ball will go in there and just ping straight back out again. 
So I think having a player down there who's going to chase, going to tackle, going to put pressure on um, is, a big, is a big benefit to us. Yeah, I was very impressed with all of our small forwards on the weekend. Um, uh, Hannon, you know, a lot of these guys don't have huge stats, but they all do their bit parts and, uh, you know, provide a lot of pressure. Hannon was there again. Um, uh, Fritch, um, every single week I'm more and more impressed by this guy. And uh, Spargo didn't have a lot of stats, but uh, there was one really good passage of play uh, that I was wrapped with. Um, I put it up on uh, Facebook and on uh, Demon Land today. It was the the uh, Christian Petrarca. Uh, this whole passage of play was fantastic. Uh, Petrarca had smothered the ball. Nibbler picked it up. He handballed it to um, Spargo, who did this little shimmy and kicked beautifully into space to, to track who had run all the way down the field. Uh, the ball bounces up for track and he, he has the presence of mind to tap it over uh, to Melksham who, who finished it off uh, with a beautiful goal, beautiful snap. Um, but that shimmy from Spargo just showed like the class that he has and I'm, I'm quite happy if they persist with him. I know they'll probably give him a break at some point and very well could be this week. Uh, but yeah, I'm wrapped with him at the moment. Uh, yeah, look, he, uh, uh, always having a crack, um, so you can't ask for too much more than that. And uh, Mungrel's just posted in the chat room, Fritch moving up the field has allowed A and B's role to be more defined in the forward line. Fritch up the field has been a revelation, uh, which is saying something because he was a revelation uh, <laughs> when he came into the forward line. But um uh, providing a great option up the ground. We know he's got good hands, uh, beautiful user of the ball. So he's really excelling as a bit of a link man at the moment and uh, the sky's the limit. Now, we um, uh, can't uh, talk about uh, our forwards and not talk about uh, probably the one that uh, impresses me the most and has been since he's come back into the team as has really just showed how much we missed him in the earlier part of the year, and I'd love to get a crack at a, a few of those teams we lost to with him in there. Tom McDonald was absolutely fantastic once again, and just really, you, you play him anywhere on the field, he, he he's he's amazing. He's amazing to watch, and you know, he, he, dead eye Dick. I think he's kicked um, how many goals is he kicked now? Twelve or thirteen goals, two behinds. Yep, and one of the one of those behinds was a uh, just a hurried snap out of the yep. pack against the, uh, the against the Suns, and then the second one was a On the side, pressure yeah. pressure free uh, ping at the end of the game, which for a second I was like kind of like damn I would wish we would have won by one hundred and fourteen <laughs> points, and then a kind of half a second later I was like nah, this is pretty good I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go with this it would have been a, the more the merrier but. Uh, Still, no, no need to get upset about uh, just winning by 109. Can I just mention another forward who didn't get as many plaudits as Tom McDonald on the weekend but was singled out by the coach? Um, well, uh, two of them were singled out by the coach. Can two be singled out? Probably two doubled out by the coach. <laughs> but yeah. um, Jesse Hogan, how good are his hands? Um, two perfectly weighted hand passes, one to Milksham in the square for a goal, another to Jones at 50 for a goal, and then a third which was absolutely at the speed of light to Nibbler running past, which um, also finished in a goal. Uh, He is absolutely sensational, um, Jesse Hogan. Uh, He's got the full bag of tricks. The Milksham one was amazing. It was like... It was one of those ones when it comes off the hand, you sort of think, what the hell are you doing? And it just floated over and just dropped absolutely precision spot right into Milksham's hand. Yeah, had it been either side or slightly, you know, out by a millisecond, it wouldn't have been a goal because there were a few players in the square, but the timing was just impeccable. It's not just uh, his handballing either, it's his uh, field kicking. Um, yeah. Just absolutely spot on. Uh highly skilled you know didn't really trouble the scoreboard but he does so much work he contributed to quite a few goals and just in the setup and I'm wrapped with him this year I think he's really hitting his straps and I think we haven't even seen his best yet so 
What's yeah, the, the second the second part to that, and this is what Goodwin was talking about, and Tim Smith did this on a number of occasions, uh, was just bringing the ball to ground, and Smith particularly did it a few times where uh, he was outnumbered two to one in a contest and still managed to spoil the ball, and a few of those occasions ended up in goals. So uh, I thought he did pretty well on the weekend, Tim Smith, yeah. without without racking up huge numbers or, or having a huge impact on the scoreboard. And I'm glad Goodwin pointed it out. I was I was wrapped with Tim Smith. Um, I think he might even just be ahead of Wiedemann at the moment. I think if I had the choice between the two of them in the team, uh, and that's not to say that I don't think Wiedemann's going to be an important part for us um, at some point, but um, he was a great replacement for him this week. Uh, did quite well in the ruck as well. He had nine hitouts. Um, uh, I was a bit worried going in um, with... I wasn't sure who was going to play the second ruck. I thought we'd pull Tom McDonald into that, and I was glad that we did. We used Tim Smith, and I thought he was quite admirable in uh, in that endeavour. Did, did you enjoy the second ruck debut of Clayton Oliver uh, in, in the middle <laughs> when the Carlton kicked a goal, and somehow we must have ended up with with Smith gone, everyone out, and Oliver he didn't even contest it. And we and still got, got the clearance. ball straight out of the middle and, and <laughs> took back the goal about 15 seconds later. It was fantastic. I didn't enjoy it. How How is it that a guy who's had hand surgery oh, in the yes. week is left to do the rucking duties? And I, I, it's a genuine question because there were three other players in the square at the time. Why I enjoyed it because he didn't even bother to try and hit it with the <laughs> Nintendo Power Glove. He just, he just stood there and waited to uh, shark cruiser's hit out which was ridiculous like cruiser could have just belted that 30 meters in the direction of his goal and instead he tried the the fancy tap down and and oliver was effectively standing there waiting to rove it i can't even remember if he's the one that got it but it, that was, was insanity by he cruiser that he, he wouldn't have just thumped it forward yeah i'm glad we uh lost that cruiser cup uh, did we lose it or win it i can't remember what uh <laughs> we we won it. We won it, and they they tried very hard. Not no, no, no. I'm not talking about who won the game. <laughs> when you talk about the Cruiser Cup, did we by not getting him? Did we win? I don't know. Any uh, suggestion of <laughs> Melbourne winning any kind of silverware, and I get excited. <laughs> um, so, uh, Clary, that yeah, we'll talk about him because um, kudos to the Melbourne Football Club and their medical staff and keeping that completely under wraps. I don't think anyone had any idea uh, that he went in for surgery um, on Monday. Um, maybe that's why he was kept back in uh, in Brisbane. <laughs> it was maybe it wasn't a, a, a drug test. Uh, maybe they were hiding something else. Maybe he couldn't hold it. <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking that as well. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, um, but uh, yeah, you know, no one knew about this. So I think just before the game. Someone messaged me through Facebook on d or someone had messaged him saying, I've heard a rumour that uh, Oliver's out. Mm. And I couldn't find anything anywhere, nothing on Twitter, nothing anywhere. Uh, so I'm not sure where he heard that. Um, but I saw it go past on Twitter at one point, but uh, it was sort of so like fanciful speculation that I didn't take it seriously. But potentially there might have been something to it. Well, there obviously was. Seem, yeah, he, he didn't seem uh, too badly uh, affected by it. No, uh, you know, 26 possession, 18 handballs, you know, 15 contested, uh, still racking up those stats, uh, you know. Uh, Clayton Oliver, you know, it, it, it's like when he has a, a quieter game, he still does so much. Because at times I thought, oh, I haven't noticed him that much, but he's there. <laughs> I liked his goal in the final quarter too. Yeah. Like very, I think it was the second or third last goal of the game, which came from a Mitch Hannon tackle and the ball spilled out. He seemed to, if you look on the replay, A, it looks like he's smiling as he sort of runs towards goal. And B, it looked like he absolutely kicked the cover oh, off it. I was just about to say. And was trying to kick it out of the stadium. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Because that he's was given the... it an almighty thump. That was the dictionary definition of a gleefully thumping home a goal. Yes. Like, yes. He did both. He was gleeful and he thumped home the goal. And that was obviously the one that took us over the, the coveted triple figures. So I don't know if that was yep. playing on his mind uh, when he did that or he just uh, was thinking about that Carlton bloke he had the stash with last year and rubbing it into <laughs> him. 
I don't know about you guys, but I follow, there's a website, liveladders.com slash AFL, and they've got the live ladders as you go along. And I was sort of having a glance at it all day because I was really wanting to get into that third spot. I don't know what, you know, it doesn't really mean much at this time of year, but I guess it does for percentage wise. But at halftime, it was, you know, it tells you, it doesn't just give you the live ladder of where you are at the time, but it tells you how much you need to get to upper spots to the next spot. And I think at halftime we needed 62 more points more than Carlton at that time um, uh, to go into third. And then you know, I thought, oh, we might not get that. And then third, three-quarter time, I think we only needed to beat them by 31 more points. Um, and we just ended up doing it. I, I was wrapped. And thank God for, um, for Brisbane who um, – helped us uh well that didn't help us get into third but it, it bent that hawthorne uh, couldn't overtake us yeah and it's good for the future for the rest of the season i did a uh, the afl haven't put their ladder predictor up yet which is uh, insanity because why is that use it from round one there's, exactly i want to use it from round one there's got to be some reason they're holding that back i think they probably don't want people to, <laughs> to think that the season might be over at any point uh, yeah correct they don't want they want to string some you know bulldogs and freo fans along for a few more weeks um, I did find a, a homebrew XL one nice. uh, on, on the net, uh, and I and I ran it, and I still I was being very conservative. I, I gave us the games we sh- we definitely should win, and I was conservative in the games against what we would term better teams, even though we're higher on the ladder than most of them. And I still came out with us having to beat GWS in the last round. So maybe I'm being a bit negative on that, but at the same time, seeing Hawthorne lose and having seen Geelong lose um, was very heartening. It'll be nice if a few of those, the you know, those Essendons, even like a Carlton, if they can come up and knock off a team here and there. Um, you know, I think we still need a few of those to, to sort of happen. But what, what do you make of, um, you know, people continue to say about our last month and you can only play who you play. Um, and we've definitely done well in those games, but people are still saying we haven't done anything yet. Um, well, that'd be wrong. And I did post this in the post-match discussion thread. People have underestimated the victory over the Blues because it completes a very important equation. And there are, it only takes 18 steps. Um, but we can beat everybody in the competition, including Richmond. Now, bear with me for a minute. We beat Carlton. Carlton beat Essendon, who beat Geelong, who beat the Giants who've beaten the Bulldogs, who beat the Suns, who beat North, who beat Sydney, who beat the Eagles, who beat Power, who beat the Dockers, who have beaten the Saints, who have beaten the Lions, who, of course, beat the Hawks on the weekend. The Hawks have knocked off Collingwood. Collingwood beat the Crows, and the Crows beat Richmond. So Richmond beat us. <laughs> it's a Ouroboros. It's the circle of life, but we, well, we can, can arrange it is, the season. It is to technically stop possible now for us to beat absolutely everybody in the competition. So um, we'd, we'd get him in a uh, semi final if the season halted now. So if we could just end things, we can uh, get a first week of the final against Richmond. Ninety five thousand people. That'd be nice. Yeah, I was having a look at the ladder and uh, I thought, yeah, it, it, I, I can't remember how it exactly works, but it's very possible. Um, do we, Yeah, if we could knock off Richmond in the... <laughs> let's, we're getting so far ahead of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> if we knocked off Richmond in the, in the first final, we could have a nice ride into a grand final oh, against an interstate team. <laughs> isn't it nice to even dream like that? I remember... A couple of years ago, there was a Friday night game in Adelaide where whatever the result was, it temporarily put us into eighth. And we were like astounded, jaws dropped. Oh, my God, we're just in the eighth. <laughs> and now two years later, we're talking about getting the hot run to a grand final. So, you know, I know what I'd prefer. Someone tell the club they can already mail their uh, finals uh, <laughs> brochures out. <laughs> no, uh, you've got to hand it to Goody and the players, though, because yeah. uh, after round five, we were two and three with a percentage in the 80s. Yep. And uh, um, four weeks later, uh, we're six and three in a percentage in the high 120s. So we couldn't have, the... couldn't have done any better than, uh, um, than that over the, over the past month. Half time of the Essendon game, people were ready to riot. Um, but ever since then, it's been, uh, you know, you, you can't argue with it. That's the thing. At least we've won four games in a row as favourites. 
Like, how often in previous years have we gone into games as favourites and lost, often against Carlton? Uh, this time, we've we've avoided the banana banana peels, and now, yes, we have to back it up this week, and then we have to go back to playing the Bulldogs the week after. But it's we've done what we needed to do, and now we get to find out whether it translates to, to the better teams. Yeah, and, and Destroy All's making a good point in the chat room in that uh, at half time, or it might have even been quarter time of the Essendon game, uh, Clint Biscuit uh, posted a thread saying, sell me some hope, please. And uh, ever since then, the club hasn't looked back. So um, I can see that he's now taking credit in the chat room. So well <laughs> done to Clint. It's, uh, it's on your shoulders, my friend. Now, now, Super Mercado, have you warmed up yet to the disco jumper? Oh, mate, I love that jumper. <laughs> like, I'm not suggesting we throw out the real one. That's that's a step yes, too no, far. Of course, <laughs> but that jumper is now four and zero. Yeah, uh, uh, you ca- you're not counting. Percentage. You're not counting AFLX. <laughs> Sorry, we're however many <laughs> and JLT. <laughs> yeah, or, or the you know 1970s and 1980s. <laughs> yes. so I, I did see on Twitter someone posted the actual all time record of that jumper, and it was. <laughs> Fairly grim reading, but the new one, <laughs> which those of you who are there in the eighties, tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I swear this one is even more disco blue. Well, it's the shiny, the, it's the sheen to it that yeah. it has to it. <laughs> so this it's one's a very seventies got the, got the shade, ultimate Studio Fifty Four <laughs> look. Um, yeah, I love it. Just when I saw it on on uh, the weekend, I got excited just by seeing it coming out. So might be a might be a, a letdown when we come out in the the normal jumper on Sunday. Well, um, uh, and it will be our normal jump. I'm sure Adelaide will be forced to wear white uh, this week. And um, But um, I remember when Richmond played in the grand final uh, and had to wear that yellow number, um, I, was, I was thinking I'd be livid if we had to wear uh, our away Guernsey in a, in a final. But that was when we were in the horrible white one. Uh, if in the barley and look, top. if we got into a granny, I wouldn't care. I'd wear anything. I'd, I'd go nude, but um, uh, yeah, I, I'd be quite happy to wear that if we had to. Obviously, I'd like to win in the, in the normal strip, but uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. Have we have we actually ever had a good clash jumper? There was possibly the red the, one. That I like the red demon one. on it. Yeah, I didn't mind that one, but I think that got banned for being too uh, not distinctive enough. But they had the horrible, like the silver one. Yeah. With the stripe across it. That was garbage. And I, I'm pretty sure we were wearing that the day Matthew Lloyd kicked eight, took mark of the year, and Mark Jamar tried to kick a goal from one metre out and missed. <laughs> that's that's what I perceive that game uh, to be, the, the silver jumper and all that. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, uh, look, I, I'd I'd be more than happy. This is my favourite uh, away Guernsey, not just because we've had the wins in it. I I, I like it. Um, I'm all, I'm on board uh, with it. Um, I think we we just as we're rounding off the the players. Um, uh, I, last few weeks, I've noticed uh, I haven't even mentioned Nathan Jones, and oh, he just c- continues to be do Nathan Jones type stuff, and you know. <laughs> I just love this bloke, and I just think back to the last decade. And at Super Mercado, you'd know because you've documented it so well. But you know, the guy's bled for the club, and I'm just happy to see him. You know, start to reap some reward uh, for for all of his efforts over that time, and you know, racked up 31 possessions and was very you know important to that win. He's in really good form, isn't he, at the moment? Yeah. Anybody who's ever been on the AFL tables uh, famous page that lists the players with the worst win-loss records in the <laughs> league, uh, I'm now proud to say that Nathan Jones has escaped that list, and it is official now that there is not one serving Melbourne player in the top 20. Uh, and ironically, Lyndon Dunn and Jeremy Howe have both escaped as well, based on Collingwood <laughs> not being as bad. So Steph Martin is the last man standing. <laughs> he is the uh, sixth worst win-loss record of any player with more than 50 games. But now, for the first time in many years that I've been following this famous list, there is not a single serving Melbourne player in it. Amen. I like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, Just speaking of Jonesy, the, uh, that goal that he kicked where Hogan hand-passed him to him at 50, was he being a bit greedy and perhaps not following team rules in, having a sh- in taking the shot, which he did kick, who was um, there? When there are about three or four players 
who were forward of 50 completely um, unmarked. I think Christian Petraka was one of them. Um, well, what, I thought that was a bit what, funny. What point in the game was it? Were we well and truly in Oh, front? I was late because, in the third. Yeah. I think it was the last goal of the third quarter. Yeah, well, so. you, you got to, at that stage, obviously if it's a tight game, you, you might question that, but... When you're thumping a team, I think the captain has every right to, <laughs> to go back and have a ping uh, at it. Uh, yep. Uh, Drunken167 agrees with you. So, yep. Um, so we, we've we broken – well, it's not a really an embarrassing record. Uh, you know, we've got that thread that's been running for a while. Uh, you know, another of these embarrassing records uh, gone. Uh, it's not really an embarrassing record, but it's good to uh, add to those 100-point wins – um, uh, Demon Land Player of the Year, um, Maxi still in command of that. Um, I know uh, Super Mercado, you keep your own um, log of uh, of uh, your own Player of the Year. Who's who's leading yours? Oh, I'm I'm alongside you. I've got uh, Maximum. We're working on a five four three two one scale, and I've got Maximum on twenty four two ahead of Oliver. Uh, and he's five ahead of Hogan with Jones on 14 and Melsham, the only other man on double figures on 11. Okay, so we had, um, yeah, we've got similar to you. Um, we've got uh, Maxi on top, Oliver second, Jones is third, uh, Hogan fourth, and uh, Melsham uh, came into equal uh, fifth with uh, Salem So um, it's, this week. It's strange that I would be the one that didn't have the Nathan Jones bias, given that he's, uh, he's a six-time <laughs> winner, no, five-time winner, pardon me, of the Alan Jack Rich <laughs> medal between 2007 and 2016. The only man ever to win it more than once. <laughs> uh, nice. Um, and I know How about that... Maxi getting among the goals every week? It's just just his casual one or two each week these uh, these days. Pretty good. Well, we've been, uh, well, I say we, like if there's more than one person involved, have been handing out the Djakovic since 2005, uh, and there's never been a non-midfielder win it, um, as you do. So this could be the first year Gorn. Uh, he's, he's got the lead. He's already been named the provisional winner of the Jim Steins Medal for Ruckman of the Year <laughs> for the fifth time. Uh, I think this might be the year that he uh, he finally breaks breaks down the door for uh, non midfielders. Well, I still think he's uh, in big contention for the for the Brownlow uh, Coaches Awards. He um, uh, got a couple of votes, and he's uh, closing in on Nathan Fife. Um, he's only a couple behind him now. He's equal second uh, with Darling. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, get, yeah. Your, get your money on. I think the goals have to help as well. Like that's that's something that it's one thing doing the normal Ruckman thing, but when you're showing up forward, kicking goals, and then you're turning up in the back line, and uh, not that he had to do that on the weekend, but uh, the other games when he's been taking relieving marks in defence, that's the stuff that umpires are really going to notice. There's a bit of discussion in the chat room about David Roden. Did anyone notice? I noticed this at the ground on the scoreboard and then saw it again on the replay when I was watching last night. He started smiling during the third quarter yes. when he was oh. signalling goals for us. He just I, couldn't I just couldn't help well. himself, I don't think. I noticed yeah. him early. He wasn't smiling early. Like a few times he did it. He had a very straight face, but later on in that game, yeah. the grins no, came no, out. the same. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, Maxi is still at $26 for the Brownlow, I reckon. Uh, get on him. In a yep. double with uh, McDonald to win the Coleman. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's at uh, McDonald's a little bit back in the in the Coleman. He's going to have to get a good uh, price. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and Jesse, I think, is now the only player in the competition to have kicked a goal in each of the nine games. So uh, let's hope that continues too. And what a scenario when we can wait till we're 102 points in front before he kicks <laughs> his first. Well, it just shows, uh, you know, we're not uh, 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 certainly not a one-trick pony down forward. Lots of people bobbing up for goals, and uh, we're not reliant on any one person. Um, good, uh, good situation to to be in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Well, Casey, um, well, I'll open this up. Drunken, if you want to, I know you're in the chat room. If you want to give us a call or anyone else wants to give us a call uh, after that, uh, 0390163366 or Demonland31. Um, and I think we've got Drunken calling in now. Thank you, sir. Um, good evening, Drunken. You there? Yeah, evening, guys. How you doing? Good, mate. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Oh, actually, not too bad at all. It was very, very good after that weekend. <laughs> what a weekend uh, it was, um, and you were down at Casey. I, I'll, I'll hazard to guess that you were. Yep. I was down on Saturday down at Frankston Park or Skybar Stadium, I think it's called now. Yeah, Skybar um, Stadium, that, yep. So, yeah, so the Frankston game, it mirrored, very strangely mirrored the Carlton game a lot. Um, so Frankston were pretty good in the first quarter, held Casey and they were like pretty close to level at quarter time but then Casey just ran away with it after quarter time like Melbourne did and then just absolutely destroyed them, 107 points in the end so pretty close to the Melbourne victory Well I think you've given us an extra point I thought it was 106 points uh, and, uh, 107 but, Oh, that's not what my uh, stats here say uh, <laughs> but Anyway <laughs> <laughs> Let's agree to disagree Um uh, who impressed you? Um, I noticed that Pedersen and Bug uh, kick six and five. Um, yep. They've got a so bit. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. Look, Frankston haven't been bad, but they don't have any AFL listed players. They're a fairly young team coming back from a, a season out of the VFL. So they didn't really have any good defenders. So Pedersen was just absolutely able to absolutely run right around everyone. Well, any ball that come towards him, he just was easily able to out-position and out-mark anyone. Um, but, yeah, he was very impressive. I think he took 10 marks a day and kicked six goals. Um, had, like, a couple of really, really good clunks from deep kicks in the forward line that finished him off nicely. So I think he finished with six goals, one for the day. Um, and Bug as well. Bug didn't have a... Well, I didn't think he had a lot of disposals, but I think he ended up with 20-something disposals for the day. And... As the game sort of opened up after half time, he was able to get onto a lot of balls and just do what he does and pop up every now and again and kick some goals. What what a what a bad week to to kick five goals in the twos because <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't think there's you know barring any uh, midweek injuries, I don't think there's a chance he'll get in this this week. And uh, you know you'd think after five goals, if someone hadn't performed well, he'd be the first one uh, sort of picked. Uh, you got to feel feel sorry for him. It's the same with Patterson. Um, I think from what I heard, he was pretty dirty not being selected because he's been playing pretty well in the twos. Um, and so I think this was his game to come out and sort of stick it to the coaching staff and not picking him. Um, but the same thing, like, after a big win in the, in the seniors, it's unlikely that Patterson's going to find a spot next week. Well, I'll ask you, you were, you were very bullish on the bull. Um, and you were very happy that he got a game and you were wanting everyone to get around him uh, when he kicks his first goal at the G. Uh, unfortunately, he kicked two behind, so he didn't get that goal. Uh, what did you think of his game? Did you see any of it? Yeah, so I was at the game, um, sitting behind the goals with the, the VFL boys watching on, and I thought, he was, like, I thought he was great. He had a couple of really important marks. Even when he was in the ruck, he took that defensive mark, I think it was in the second quarter. Yeah. Right, basically, as the last man. Yeah. Um, yep. And, like, even though he like, didn't have any, like, huge forward half grabs or anything, he it's been said before that he was one on two a lot of times and was just able to bring the ball to ground and able to compete on the ground and, and hands it out to the outside runners. And I think he ended up having eight or nine score involvements for the game. Um, so, I don't know, I thought he did. Like, Simon Goodwin mentioned him in the pro, post-match press conference and said he did. Didn't have a massive game, but he did his job and he did his job well, which is what I knew he was going to do. Drunken, two players uh, get your uh, get your updates on from uh, from Casey. Uh, everyone's interested in Jeffy Garlett. He's obviously seen as if there are going to be changes, uh, a change that Jeffy is perhaps. Um, uh, probably the first cab off the rank to potentially get a Guernsey this week. And also an update, if you could, on deck, because I understand he uh, got a got a knock again on the weekend, which isn't his first. Yeah, so, yeah, deck has been a bit played uh, with head knocks. This is probably his fourth or fifth from his time. The last 
his time since Tack Cup that I can remember. So he was just, he was in a he was actually tackling someone and he got a stray elbow to the side of the head, um, and then it was a ball up and he sort of stood up a bit dazed, and then the ball comes straight to him from the ruck contest and he got tackled again and that that sailed a second tackle really knocked him about. Um, so he's he's not too bad. He's he actually well he hasn't pulled up 100% okay. He got sent home Monday because the docs weren't happy with how he was feeling. Um, so he's taking it pretty easy, but they're going to see how he goes Thursday. And if he's feeling all right Thursday, he should be all right for the weekend. But, yeah, hopefully hopefully it's not too bad. Um, but, yeah, Jeffy, Jeffy sort of didn't have a, a lot of touches, but it's it's hard to describe without actually seeing it yourself. Just He's just so skillful with the ball and around the stoppages. This is There was this one play where... It was a it was a loose ball to the wing. It was about four or five players around it, and the ball was sort of bouncing. And he sort of basketball bounced the ball towards himself, grabbed it, spun around three players, and then run five meters and kicked it to someone who ended up kicking a goal. Um, it's those, those little things, and it, his pressure was very good. I think that's that's what the coaching staff were looking for to, to see that those pressure things um, be brought back into his game. And I thought he was very good in the weekend with that. Where are they playing him? So he rotates between midfield and half forward at the moment. Um, but that happens a lot with the... Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, Dex just yelling out to me. Um, <laughs> oh, does yeah, De- does Deck of... want to come on and <laughs> have a mini interview? <laughs> yeah, hang on. Well, maybe, maybe we will get him on in. <laughs> hey, Deck, want to come say hi? <laughs> No. Right. Um, shot down yeah. by another <laughs> Melbourne player. <laughs> um, yeah, so you'll see a lot of times those that sort of those half forward blokes in the seniors when they drop back to the twos will play midfield just because they're better than the other midfielders playing in the twos. Um, yeah. But no, Jeff, he was and he kicked. He only kicked one goal for the game, but it was a very very good goal. He sort of got a ball loose in the pocket. He sort of swung around onto his left and kicked it, snapped it from about forty out. Was very impressive. So I think, like some have mentioned, that maybe Spargo, because he didn't have a lot of touches on the weekend, maybe it's time for him to have a rest, and especially to be in the Northern Territory game, they might bring him in. I think he showed enough on the weekend that he's ready to be back playing AFL. Yeah. Um, what about Jaden Hunt? Um, you know, lots been said about him in the last couple of weeks with confidence being down, and noticed he had about twenty-four disposals. But how did you see his game? So, unlike others, which I was reading the thread, I thought that was Hunt's best game, VFL game of the season. Um, he was back, back to the, he's breaking the lines and, and uh, good running. He really was much cleaner with the ball than he has been. So, no, I thought Hunt, Hunt was a lot better. And again, like it's against poor opposition, but no, he, drunk, he, drunk, and you're just breaking up. You're breaking up a little he, bit there. Play as much better football. Uh, drunk, and you were just breaking up a little bit there. So we didn't really catch that. What you said about uh, Jaden? I think we. Nope. I'm sorry. Uh, 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 Is it better now? That's better. That's a bit better. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Lean sideways. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe put the phone, phone out the window. <laughs> that sometimes works. Um, yeah, I, I, I noticed that um, I noticed that uh, Frosty uh, was in the best, and I was just having a look at his uh, his dispo- his disposals, and he's only had eleven disposals and five marks. So uh, I, d- I was wondering who's done these uh, the best uh, for Casey because. Uh, he must have done some miraculous things with those 11 disposals to get second best in the best. And I'm just having a look. Is there someone else called Frost in the team that maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Drunken, you there? Have you? Is your connection improved? And it doesn't seem that it if, has. If we do get Drunken back on, I'd be interested in uh, talking about Oscar Baker. Um, I yes. get excited when I see the words quick and run and carry. 
in the same sentence. So I'd be interested in knowing how he went, obviously, against lesser opposition. But uh, he seems to have had a few good write-ups in the last few weeks. Yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, I reckon he'll get a game probably at some point during this year, and I'm excited to see him. I also wanted to ask um, Drunken about uh, Harley Ballack because um, it, I can see he's only had uh, he's had 15 disposals, eight kicks, seven handballs, one goal. But I, I would have thought he, he's probably uh, in my in my estimation. I think that he's a similar player um, to 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 Bug in that type of position, um, and uh, you know I, you know you would sort of want him to be kicking sort of goals uh, as well. Uh, he's had one goal, so, yeah. Uh, Drunken, you uh, back on the line? Yep, how's that now? Is this a bit better? It is absolutely crystal clear, fantastic. Right, so, Jaden Hunt, uh, we yeah. didn't, didn't get any of that, so, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I, unlike others, I thought Hunt was very, very good in the weekend. I thought he was his best game since going back to the VFL. Um, it was against lesser opposition, but he was back to breaking the lines and running off half-back, and his disposal was a lot better than it has been. So, yeah, he's starting to starting to back, play some good footy. And Super Mercado wanted to know about Oscar Baker. Yes, um, Baker as well. He's been impressive. Um, I thought he, that was probably one of his best games as well. Um, he's sort of... I don't really know how to describe what position he plays because he rotates a lot from half back to half forward and midfield. Um, but he's very clean with the ball and he's, he's quick, good disposal, and uh, he sort of he knows what to do with it when he gets the ball. So if he can keep up playing well um, and if they need him, he can definitely slot into the team, I think, sometime this year. And the other one I'm interested in is Harley Ballack. Uh, what, what's, where's he at? Uh, um, I was saying before that I thought he's a similar player to, to Bug. Um but obviously not getting oh, on the scoreboard, not the same uh, thing. Is he playing in the half forward? Uh, where's he playing? Yeah, so you've nailed it pretty much straight in the head. He's exactly the same kind of player as Bug, same position, same kind of thing. He's just he's he's pretty good. Um, he's better overhead than Bug is. Uh, he's just he's not getting the numbers as like Bug or Gallard or, or some of those uh, better players. But he's not he's not too bad. He's sort of because he did, he was out of the game for a long time yeah. over at Fremantle and stuff. So I think maybe another preseason or another year with the boys, he he might be able to play some some play some better footy. Uh, excellent, uh, guys. Is there anyone else uh, that you want to uh, ask uh, Drunken while we've got him on the on the horn? Maybe we could clarify your uh, Sam Frost. Yes, yes. Question. All right. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard that, Drunken, but uh, the the best that's listed. Uh, in uh, Casey from Casey's uh, write-up, uh, Frost is the second best, but I had a look at his stats and he's only had 11 disposals, so I'm wondering how good were those 11 disposals uh, to be <laughs> na- named in the best? Yeah, I, did, I didn't think he was second best. Number, but he, he was good. He had a few really important defensive marks where he floated across um, the top of packs. And if, if I have a look real quick, how many marks did he take he for the game? five. Um, Five. Five marks. Yeah, so like pretty much all those five marks were big contested marks that I can remember. Um, and like he didn't need to have a huge number because it wasn't really in the back line that often after quarter time. Um, but what he did do with the ball was very impressive, that's for sure. Uh, nice. Any, anyone else, uh, guys, uh, that you want to know about? Who've, uh, who've, I think Casey got Port Melbourne this week. Um, how are they tracking and what's the expectation deck? Not deck. deck. Um, drunken. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did. We couldn't yeah, get sorry. deck. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Port Melbourne won, obviously won the flag last year, and after they won the flag, a few of their senior players sort of pulled the pin and went, that's it, I've won my flag, I've had enough, I'm out. So they haven't been going as well this year. Um, so even though it's at Port's home ground, I think we should be clear favourites. And we we should be able to get the job done fairly easily over them. Uh, Billy Stretch, uh, I think we talked about him the last time you were on. Uh, how's he been going the last two weeks? Yeah, so the Box Hill game, which unfortunately I couldn't speak about because I was working, he was very, very impressive, best on ground by quite a bit. 
um, huge numbers and did a lot with the ball. His pressure and was really good. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to translate that to this weekend. He was sort of not very noticed. He played midfield pretty much all game, um, but was nowhere near as good as he was up against Box Hill, which is surprising given Frankston with a lesser team. Uh, uh, was it last week, Grape Viney, that we were talking about um, sort of the, the future of our, our back line um, and, you know, what's sort of going to happen when um, uh, both uh, Lewis and Vince sort of winding down uh, who we've sort of got in the wings waiting for them? Was it was that last week? Or... Yep. Yeah, yep. so... Uh, Jim, drunk... Lewis is going all right, isn't he? He is. Put in another very good game on the weekend. Yeah, we didn't talk about him, but he he did have a great game. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think uh, in terms of replacements? And this is obviously down the track a little bit, but uh, who have we got sort of uh, waiting in the wings um, that you can see replacing those guys? So obviously the two probably most experienced would be Wagner and Hunt. Um, if they've, they've played some good games at AFL level. Obviously you can't break into the side at the moment, but we've seen what they can do when they play at their best. Um, Joel Smith. Oscar Baker. Joel Smith, sorry, yeah, Joel Smith. Yes. He he's been playing really good the last couple of weeks. Obviously, coming off a bad run of injuries last year, um, but he played very good in the weekend. Had had some really strong marks and um, some good disposals of sort of half back midfield. So I think he can do that that Joan, uh, Lewis Vince role really well. And then yeah, Oscar Baker. Um, if he keeps playing good footy, he he could do that well that role as well. Excellent. Um, anything else, boys, with uh, in terms of Casey stuff? Uh, not for me. Not for you. All right, drunken. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for that wrap up. Uh, we look forward, to, always look forward to it. Uh, obviously, with you getting to go down to the games and watching it, uh, it's great to have someone to come on and uh, give us a, a first hand uh, first hand experience uh, of of the game. So, thank you very much. No worries, guys. Thanks for that. It's really good going on to the Casey games. I met actually another Deemland poster, uh, Diamond Jim. He came up and said hi to me throughout the game. He must have seen me yelling about Declan or something. <laughs> um, and before the game started, Justin Plaff and Simon Goodwin came up to me and, me and my parents, and we had a good chat with them for a couple of minutes before the game. Nice. So it's always good getting along. Nice. Oh, fantastic. All right, so uh, next time just make sure you uh, ask... Um you ask Woody, uh, give him our number and uh, get him to talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right. I'll see what I can do. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Speaking of the uh, speaking of the reserve grade, I, I've got an answer for you on the uh, the best triple header win uh, in club history. <laughs> that would be round 10, 1964. The seniors won by 113. Uh, the reserves won by seven goals, and the under 19s won by about 10 goals. Oh. So that was uh, probably just a little bit more than the seniors and reserves combined this week. That's amazing. Uh, where are you pulling all these stats from? Have you got a spreadsheet that you can? Uh, you can. Well, if you, if you head to uh, demonwiki.org and look at any of the games <laughs> uh, individually, you'll see the reserves and under 19 scores as well. So it was uh, merely a case of pulling the 100-point win list out and uh, checking those ones. Can you refresh my memory? I was actually interstate in 2004, so I missed the most recent 100-point victory. I can't remember the 1993 one over the Hawks, yeah. but I, the last no, one I Richmond. remember was at, was at Princess Park against Fitzroy in yes. what would have been their last or penultimate season. What were the details around that? It was either 119 or 131? It was actually round two, 1991. So yep. it, it was came that came after the week we kicked two goals against West Coast in the opening round, uh, and we backed up with 27 the next week uh, for a 131 point win. Darren Bennett kicked eight, and that is the other game along with that Richmond one where we won the seniors by 100 and won the reserves and under 19s. But in this case, we only sneaked through by 16 points in the reserves, thanks to five goals from Brian Steins. <laughs> one goal, to, one goal to Alan Jakovic. Well, that, well that's funny Jakovic because Jakovic would have been back in the two well, then. Yes, because Jakovic played in that first game. Yeah. He spoke to us on on this uh, podcast about the first game. Uh, was dropped for the second, uh, and if he had he played, uh, I wonder 
how many goals he would have kicked in that uh, well, that massive might have win. been yeah that might have been his uh, his big breakout there it's funny he actually came to a um not to get onto Jakovic chat as much as as much as I'd like to, he came to a, a school clinic at my school in between that first game, and I think he came back for one more game, possibly in Adelaide, got dropped again, then came back and went banana at the end of the season. And it was so he just had no interest in doing the school, the no, school I'm... clinic. <laughs> Is... He was so and like you know you're dealing with kids in grade four at the time so I don't blame him in the slightest but I just remembered at the time thinking this guy just could not be bothered being here and then you know 12 weeks later he was my favorite player of all time <laughs> is it you that has the photo of him with it when he's in that Melbourne tra- Adidas tracksuit or something yeah I've got the one with, of me and him at the uh, family day in at the, 92 at the race where course. I'm wearing the unusual combination of an Indiana Pacers hat <laughs> <laughs> and an LA Dodgers shirt. Now, God knows, can you someone explain to me why I would have had an Indiana Pacers hat in 1992 or 1993? Well, it was very fashionable in the, now. It was very fashionable in those days to have the ba- the basketball baseball uh, cap. Uh, God. But things. you know, you, Chicago Bulls, Los Angeles, like it's no Indiana Pacers. Like, yeah, like my, I said, they're not even popular now. It's not even like you know the uh, Philadelphia 76ers where everyone's jumped on the bandwagon. <laughs> they're, they're just all the Cavs who were uh, likewise unknown in the early 90s here. Um, I have no idea why I had that hat. Possibly but... a present from a grandparent or a, or a, or a Wait, family. And Destroy all says Reggie Miller is why. And, and to <laughs> that I would say I would, would have had no idea who any <laughs> NBA player was until NBA Jam hit the arcades. <laughs> so I can't even tie myself to Reggie Miller as being the reason. Yeah, well, we'll uh, <laughs> watch this space. We might find out why. Um, all right, Casey, talk uh, done uh, and dusted. Um, injury list, uh, well, it's uh, virtually none. Um, I see that Misson today said that uh, Wiedemann is still another week off. Um, so I don't think we'll be seeing any changes uh, to our forward line structure unless they do decide to bring Pedersen in. But I think we've discussed this and... I, I think we all agree that, um, well, I agree. I know Great Viney agrees. So, um, Super Mercado, do you think um, Pedersen is part of the coaching staff's future at all? Um, or is he just spare parts uh, in case of injuries? Well, I, I have an almost fanatical devotion to Cameron Pedersen. So, my personal view is that he should be playing. But I, I guess I understand where they're going uh, in, in trying out Wiedemann and subsequently Smith um, as a future option. Uh, I th- look, I think he's the kind of guy where he would come in every year for the last few years knowing that he's going to spend a fair whack of the season in the twos. Yeah, he'd obviously want to play in the ones, but um, I think at the moment he's the kind of guy who you'd want to keep next year uh, if he was interested in staying and didn't want to you know, go and uh, you know, have an easier life playing in the, uh, the country or something like that. Just keep him there just in case because he's, he's so handy. Uh, he had that great streak at the end of last year where he really showed what he can do. Uh, I, I think it's fair enough to look for the future, but at the same time, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and uh, just shove him out the door just because he's over 30. Yeah, look, uh, both Great Viney and I are big fans of his. I really like him, but I, I can see where the coaching staff are at and... Um, yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, I think he'll only be getting games if, um, you know, if we've got injuries. Um, but I do, I, like you said, I do hope we uh, keep the guy around. Um, now, there was a good one this week, praised uh, the medicos and the fitness staff uh, as being, uh, the you know, the reason why, um, you know, we've got basically a full complement to choose from at the moment. Um and I sort of start a thread, is, 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 is this good luck or is a good prep? Um, I, I guess it's probably a bit of both, but uh, uh, what do you think? Yeah, uh, the records on their side, we had a few injuries last year, which to the credit of the football department, they covered really well. And Cam Pedersen is a big part of that. But you go back the season before that and we had a fantastic injury year. So... Um, yeah, if you're looking at the sort of body of work over the past three years, then the uh, the fitness and the medicos are tracking pretty well, aren't they? Yeah, probably with the exception of maybe how well a lot of people view the handling of uh, Jack Viney and you know did bringing yep. him back too early 
caused the issues that he had later. Um, I don't know. Um, and we didn't really talk about Viney. Um, you know, he was quiet, but he, you know, showed glimpses of, uh, of what he can do. And uh, I'm really excited for him. I think in the next few weeks, he's really going to hit his straps. I loved watching good, him good take on half the Carlton team at quarter time after the max 50-metre penalty. It was sort of almost as if he said, well, I'm not going to get too many kicks today, but I'll certainly stand up to you lot. Um, and, you know, he's only a little guy, but he loves getting in amongst the fray, doesn't he? Little? I'm sure he wouldn't like to hear that. Uh, he's talking short. Well, or... well, you don't need to play it to him. He'll probably come and hunt me down now. Um what did what did you think of the max score on that fifty metre penalty? Because it appeared that he didn't go over the mark with his feet, but uh, he certainly his arms and body sort of went forward. But he did land back, I reckon, on that spot. Uh, fifty metre penalty or not? Oh, it might be one of those ones that's technically yes, but really for the spirit of the game, <laughs> which I know the spirit of the game gets dragged out every five seconds. Um, to justify any particular argument that you want. Uh, but it's one of those... It's like when someone tackles a player and the, there is no... They sort of scrape across their back and there's no actual impediment on the player, but because they've scraped across the back, or oh, we've got to pay a free kick. Yeah. I think it was probably a bit like that. You know, we could have let it go, um, and it's not going to bring the world down, but the umpire was uh, you know, being a job's worth and just making sure that he... <laughs> He kept to the letter of the law, and uh, it was pretty funny when our players steamed in to take on the Carlton player, uh, and no one actually sort of realised that. Hold on a minute, <laughs> hold on a minute. There's something else going on here. I was hoping we wouldn't have anyone on the mark on the line, and the guy would do something stupid like try and you know handball it to a teammate <laughs> or something like that. But there was one player left. I think it might have been Jetta. It was Jetta. Who, yeah, who wandered off to the square instead of getting involved in the uh, the uh, manly jostling. So we, uh, we're travelling uh, up to uh, the Alice this week. Uh, changes. Uh, do you cha- can you change a 109-point winning combination? We know that our coaching staff uh, play for whoever we're playing against, um, you know, in terms of match-ups. But um, barring any uh, secret surgeries... Um, can you see us making any changes this week? I think there's a possibility of one change. I think uh, Garlett um, is a chance of getting in. Uh, and I think it, if he does, it won't be at the expense of Spartacus. It might be at the expense of Mitch Hannon, oh. who I don't think had a great game on the weekend. I thought he was a bit of a mixed bag, to be honest. Um, still kicked, still kicked two goals. Uh, was instrumental in the uh, probably had, would have had three had Clary not uh, picked up the ball and thumped it through before anyone could say boo. Um, but yeah, possessions wise, probably not. But uh, you know, still doing. Yeah, no, uh, he just flew on a few occasions where I thought he should have stayed down. He went up one handed a few times, and. Yeah, I don't know whether he's... Uh, it might have been Big Red Fire Engine made a good post in the changes thread just pointing out some of the... Uh, maybe some efforts where he could have um, uh, could have gone a bit harder um, or, or with a bit more intensity. Is this because you didn't get to interview him the other way? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, yes, still <laughs> still embittered about that, and have lodged a complaint with the telecommunications ombudsman <laughs> over over the events of that night. Super Mercado, what are your your thoughts? Uh, any changes this week? Well, I'm going to the other end. Um, I'm not particularly keen on Wagner, but I'm, I would bring him in instead of Vince. Um, the funny thing is, if you if you take Melksham's amazing player ratings uh, performance, you actually then have to go look at the the bottom of the list, which actually had Bernie Vince in the negative. Uh, which I'm not sure how, what that means, how how often players go in the negative. Um, but I think again, it was one of those games where you sort of just just from um, just seeing it without even looking at stats, you just know that they haven't had a great game. Uh, I doubt it will happen just because we're playing Adelaide. Yeah. Uh, and I know he's had a few great irritations against the Crows uh, over the last few years. But I think 
time again if we're if we're leaving Pedersen out, kicking eleven goals in two weeks on the basis of giving younger players a run, um, I don't see why that same philosophy couldn't be followed at the other end. Yeah, yeah, I think the Vince thing uh, in, and I'm not saying he's getting a game just for this, but I think it's the experience um, that he brings to the table, and um, perhaps. But there was one kick that he did on the weekend that really got me, and it was that one. He kicked it from the bound, almost on the boundary, straight across the ground to the top of the fifty arc, and um, wasn't a particularly great kick, and. We ended up coughing it up and cough. They got a goal out of it, and I just thought that's just you know that's you got him in there for that experience, but that is that's not the right kick. You kick across ground when you got to play a hundred meters, fifty meters clear. Um, well, that was bizarre because as he turned to look inboard, I beat him to it. My eyes got there quicker, <laughs> and there are occasions when you put up those passes and someone comes in and bolts from the blue, and you haven't really seen them, but. Before he even moved to kick that ball, Lewis was covered yeah. by two players. Two players and th- yeah. I think a third came in when the ball was kicked. So that was staggering. I think the entire ground could see what was happening <laughs> yeah, uh, before uh, before Vince did. So <laughs> I don't like I to did. point out those occasional turnovers, but that one was just uh, really stood out. I enjoyed his murderous bump on Dale yes. Thomas. I'm not sure if that counts in your favour in the AFL player ratings, <laughs> uh, carving a player up legally, as it turned out, uh, like that. But uh, that was a ripper. Um, it, you get the impression that had Daisy gone down and was concussed, uh, he would have gone um, for that. And I think the fact that Daisy got straight back up and remonstrated uh, (laughs) helped him out a bit. Now It's it's only Tuesday, so there's plenty of time for delayed concussion. (laughs) We know the the form of the Carlton doctor in this regard, so stand by. And the AFL uh, launching Could be reviewed. Yeah, I I notice um, uh, when when that happened, I was thinking of you, Super Mercado. I thought that uh, you were licking your lips because uh, Bernie, if he had gone, he would have been the... Uh, or even got a fine, he would have... He would have been back. Back as the undisputed, uh, most reported uh, Melbourne player. Or has yes, he got that Jones, title? Is no, equal? Jones caught up with him again due to a, oh. uh, a fine a yes. couple of weeks ago. So they've both gone past Grinter now. Oh, they're both past Grinter. Okay. So Balls is down to third on the list now. <laughs> he must be fuming at that. <laughs> he, again, as those of you who didn't hear us last time, he is ahead uh, significantly on weeks suspended. Yes. He's 31, <laughs> he's, uh, beats everybody else hands down. But obviously living in an era where you get reported at the drop of a hat and you know, wrestling's illegal, that's what's helped uh, Bernie and, and uh, Chunk. They've got four matches suspended between them from 24 charges, whereas Grinter had 31 suspension weeks from 11 charges. <laughs> so he got more, much more bang for his buck. As Terry Wallace will attest to. Yes. <laughs> the other, the other, the only other person on the list with uh, a two games per suspension average is Marcus Seacamp, who had six for twelve weeks. Mm. <laughs> I yep. love the Seekers. stats, including that uh, that classic uh, punch to the head of Brad Pierce. I think it was in <laughs> nineteen ninety eight at Optus Oval, where Brad gave him a little one into the guts, and Seacamp just whacked him in the face. Um, Sorry, I've seen the uh, that what was hotter than hell, nineteen ninety eight, that VHS that they put out <laughs> yes. that season. I, I saw that about a hundred and thirty two times between its release and when you know YouTube and the internet became interesting. So <laughs> oh. the events of nineteen ninety eight are permanently seared onto my brain. I've got all those videos from that era. Um, I have no idea what I did with my copy of that. I, I really need to. Uh, I need someone to uh, burn it. Because it's got that classic, uh, the one, there's a typo in one of the scores where they completely stuff it up. But uh, all the interviews are conducted with Todd Viney with his kitchen showing in the back. Uh. <laughs> and they've all got names <coughs> like 1980s mixtapes, such as yep. 1982 with a bullet. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hotter than so, yeah, it was, it was uh, same than sort of I marketing there was, department there was, uh, there was, responsible there was for those. Two one as well. I can't remember that had yeah, the same sort of, you know, the heat is on or something like that. <laughs> I've, I've got them all uh, in another room here, so uh, I wish they were sort of within arm's reach. I could pull them out, so maybe next time I'll have them uh, handy. Um, 
so Jake Lever comes up against his old club. Um, they interviewed him during the week and uh, seems quite upbeat about it. And uh, I think he's uh, looking forward to it. Uh, I'm sure he'll get a bit of lip from, you know, I'm sure there'll be a bit of biff, a bit of uh, bumping. Uh, they'll all give it to him. And um, I'm just hoping that our players uh, are right in amongst it uh, and, you know, protecting him. Not that he needs the protection, but uh, you don't want to see... Uh, you just know they're all going to sort of come up to him and bump him and give him a bit of stick before the game. And uh, I, th- yeah. I, I think it'll be like the uh, the classic Scully Carnival of Hate, where there was a bit of that at the start, and then by the end they're all shaking hands and smiling. Yeah, they've they've got to fly the flag, but it's not like there's real legitimate, you know, Carey Stevens style animosity no, with don't. his departure. Like I think Sam Jacobs or someone was uh, interviewed the other day and was like, "Oh yeah, I'm still mates with him." Yeah. So I, I expect a bit of uh, you know show show off stuff at the start, um, but I don't think it's going to degenerate into you know, the Trickier Park massacre or anything. Do you think if this game was being played at Adelaide Oval, there'd probably be a lot more spite? Do you think there'd be any money bags in the yeah, crowd? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> disappointing that it's not. To be I, I, I would rather them. That you got to have that first. Like, imagine if we'd had to play Scully in like Canberra or something first before the MCG. <laughs> yeah. We would have missed out on all the entertainment that day. The greatest comedic carnival of hate ever launched on a player. Yeah. You know, we would have blown out a bit of it before that. That just allowed us to really go for it. So it's a bit disappointing. Uh, I hope the travelling Adelaide fans will uh, do the right thing and, and boom, you know, yeah. make a goose of themselves. <laughs> there was a, a great little anecdote before because Jake was on. Uh, whichever show is on at 7 p.m. on Fox Footy, the one before AFL 360 with Neroli Meadows. And as we know, he got off Twitter earlier in the year, didn't like all the negativity and abuse that he was copying on there. And he let Neroli know that the first week or two after he got off Twitter, Max Gorn was uh, keeping a list of everything that was said uh, everything bad that was said about him on Twitter <laughs> and keeping him updated as to what he was missing out on. So um, I, I like that one. It's funny that he, he he stayed on it through the bit where he was leaving Adelaide, so where he was presumably <laughs> yeah. copying heaps, and, and, and it was our fans he's that off put now. him over the yeah. edge. Do, Which is, I think, look, I, I've always been baffled by players um, being not on social media, but players who... You know, read the responses, the players who search for their own names, and that has definitely happened in the past. Um, <laughs> it's hard not to, I guess, uh, uh, when you're in the spotlight. I guess if, if you're like Jake Melsham or something this week, you might search for it and see, you know, see everyone saying that you're awesome. Um, but uh, there are have been a lot of, to, over the years, players who have sort of gone on it and then off it very quickly again. <laughs> yeah. I think they've sort of realised, uh, you know, the pitfalls... It's not all people patting you on the back and offering oh, you, there's you know, a lot free of hate. haircuts. Yeah. Uh, well, J- J- Jack Viney uh, said he was on SEN the other day and he actually uh, said that he no longer uh, uses Twitter for much the same reason as Jake Lever. Uh, he said it was great when you are getting the pats on the back, but, uh, yeah, the, a lot of the hate that's out there uh, sort of, you know, steered him away from it. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, the, the next generation of footballers will have grown up and not only grown up with it, they're actively using uh, social media. So it might be harder for them to get away from it uh, later in life. Plus, um, everything that they've ever written or ever said is out there for, you know, yeah. the general public to pick through. And a Carlton uh, bloke. Who slagged Mick Malthouse and then got drafted by Carlton? Yeah, like exactly like that <laughs> yeah. type of stuff. You might see them saying bad things about the people potentially they're going to be playing with or or whatever. So I it'll think be surely that's got to be at the at the lower levels. So I know a few years ago that when players were drafted, they would have a, a session of yeah, how not to make a dick of yourself on social media. But they need to do it before they draft them and say what you need to do is go back through everything you've ever put on social and media, delete it. Yeah. ever put on the website and you exactly, and say, do I want to stand up against this? Yeah. Um, Cause also there was a bloke who got drafted by Sydney who'd said something about Adam goods as well. So it's like, it's amazing that maybe they, maybe you do it and don't think about it. Like I'm sure people can pull up old posts of mine and you know, there's something ridiculous and stupid I've said, 
Uh, not to that degree, of course. But I did bag Nick Malthouse a few times. Uh, <laughs> but you never played under him, so... <laughs> correct. Yeah, I'm highly unlikely to be drafted by the Sydney Swans, uh, but you never give up hope. Uh, but still, there is stuff you put out there. Um, but if I was to suddenly become a, you know, run for parliament or something, I- I'd be trawling all my old social media posts and forum posts and making sure there was nothing that could even be potentially interpreted as dubious. Yeah, well, uh, uh, look, there's going to be a lot of things that some of these players in, in five, six years' times that they said when they were 12 years old. So, yeah, yeah exactly. that'll be interesting. Um, all right, so that's Lever coming up against his old team. But also the fact that it's uh, third versus fourth this week and uh, we're playing, you know, in the middle of nowhere uh, at a pretty crappy time slot. This would have been a great game to play uh, um, on a Friday night, but that's 2020, 2020 hindsight uh, in terms of the AFL. And let's just give the uh, Carlton Blues some more uh, primetime uh, thumpings. I'm going well, to I'm going to stick up for the Alice match here because, uh, and Bin Man's made a good point um, in the chat room. Uh, it's on free to wear, which is good. Um, third versus fourth, so it's you know the game of the round. But it's a big deal for the Alice, and they've got uh, Channel 7 are going all out on this. They've got a special edition of game day starting early in the morning. They're showing the Curtain Razor, which is a match between um, a, a, a team from Darwin and then a team from, uh, from the Alice. So the best of the Indigenous talent in the NT will be on display. Um, and then, uh, and then, obviously, the main game afterwards. So, um, it's a, uh, it's been a rich talent pool for uh, um, for the league uh, going back many years, and I think it's great that uh, that the game is being played there, and, and such an important game too. And for anyone that's been to the ground in Alice, it is an, it's absolutely beautiful there. Um, Every year in the pre-game Alice thread, people talk about the heat and the humidity, mixing it up with Darwin. It's not uh, that humid at all in the Alice. It's actually perfect playing conditions, very similar to what you and I experienced uh, watching Gold Coast in Brisbane the other week, Andy. So I reckon it's going to be a ripper, and it's good for the NT. Um, So bring it on, I say. Is this... And on a more pragmatic level, if we're going to chuck the pokies, uh, I don't think these games are going anywhere anytime soon. Um, is, is this uh, pre-game, uh, this large pre-game stuff uh, to make up for the royal wedding uh, that pre- <laughs> preempted the game last week? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned the the we you know ditching the pokies um, uh, and these games aren't going anywhere. Um, you know, I love the money that we get from it, and I love the fact that we're promoting the game up there. But boy, I'd love to be playing this game at the G this week. Yeah, I think in an ideal world, you you certainly wouldn't be um, flogging these games off. But that's I think it's was it two mil they have to to find to to cover the pokies. So you got I think it's six hundred k a game for these two. Yeah. So effectively, if you were to chuck these games and blow up the pokies. That's 3.2 mil a year we've got to find to cover it. And let's just assume we're going to continue on an upward trajectory. That will definitely help. Um, you you know, Look at, obviously, all the clubs that have had success in recent years and the way their membership's gone through the roof. Uh, but it is a, a significant uh, amount of money to have to make up, potentially dialing it down to one, but maybe that you're not going to get the deal at all. Maybe it's two or nothing. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of money to, to put away. Uh, but... Obviously, I would much rather be playing this, uh, even Eddie Head Stadium, if uh, <laughs> yes. you know, we got a, if they'd pay us half of what the what the an NT are paying us. Uh, it's interesting, I, isn't yeah. it? Because the club said it can afford to get rid of the pokies, and I actually found it, um, I actually found it unusual that they've opted to, you know, to get rid of this off-field element um, and sort of wear the hit. Um, where the hit in regards to the pokies rather than our top, and I think I've said this before on the podcast, rather than our top financial priority being to bring the Northern Territory games back to the MCG. I'd much rather that that was first cab off the rank than getting rid of the pokies. I can tell you that much. 
I would agree. I mean, look, the, the pokies are, uh, are vile, but at the same time, I think we're just selling them to someone else who's going to be uh, milking the community yep. with them anyway. So it's um, I, I sort of the haste it happened with, with sort of no, you know, no warning or no discussion about it. It just makes me wonder if they don't know something about the future of pokies or the future of licenses or something like that. And they're not just cashing in while they can um, and, you know, banking the money before whatever happens, happens. Mm. And I think uh, it brings us to our next point. We need a little bit of money in the bank uh, to pay for the McDonald brothers who, uh, with every week, are commanding a uh, bigger um, paid payday. And I, I know yeah. that uh, we've still got to keep under the salary cap. Uh, we, we've learnt the hard way that way. But uh, Tom McDonald... Uh, this week, um, you know, came out and said, you know, still in contract talks, going back and forward. Um, I think the good news out of all this is that they haven't put off uh, contract talks to the end of the year. I think that's yeah. when morning bells start going off. But I think we'll keep him. Uh, I think they're just coming up with uh, with the the best deal for both uh, both the club and the player. Yeah, I'm not. Um, somebody posted in the thread today that. Resigning players is absolute the last thing you'd be concerned about at Melbourne at the moment. A, we've got all the runs on the board from the last two years where, you know, 90% of the list, um, or certainly the players that you want, have resigned and done so happily and quickly and readily and willingly. And there's absolutely no reason to think that this would be any different. Um, yep. You know, and somebody sort of said, oh, well, you know, St Kilda might make a play for him or Gold Coast or someone. It's like, well, the guys played in, you know, one of the worst teams in the history of the competition. They're just starting to come good. Why would he ditch now and, and go back to um, a team that's uh, near the bottom of the ladder? So, um, I, don't think any, I don't think there's any reason they would leave for footballing reasons. Um, the only thing I'm concerned about is where is the money coming from? Um, so we don't know the state the cap's in, but we must have thrown major money at Lever, um, presumably major money at Hogan, um, and Hogan's coming out of contract again, I think, next year. We've also got Brayshaw. We've got uh, Jetta out of contract this year. Um, we've already locked away Viney, Oliver, uh, Petrarca. There's, at some point, something's got to break in the, in the salary cap. I'm just hoping they've got enough to get those four all in, the unsigned ones from this year. Um, and then they can start working on, you know, your Hogan next year and whoever comes out of contract then. Um, but I'm just hoping we've got enough to, to get through at least the McDonald brothers, Brayshaw and Jetta. Now, what about, does that preclude us from landing that big fish uh, at the end of the year? If we if we are, as the, a lot of the media are saying, we're sort of one of the front runners for someone like Gaff. Yeah, well, um, that's what I thought. How are you going to pay for it? Yeah, like, exactly. Unless, we we don't, haven't got to the point where we can we start... To getting players to take salary cuts to stay in the successful group, like yeah. a lot of the successful teams do. They've won premierships uh, and stuff. As exactly, well. and they want to keep it together. Um, I Again, who knows how the caps work, um, you know, forward-loaded contracts and stuff like that. But I just can't imagine that we've got the money, especially after Lever, um, unless Hogan goes out somehow. Um, which I'm certainly let the record show, not suggesting that should happen. Um, but I just can't see how we could afford to bring in another blockbuster player. All the talk is that there's plenty of plenty of room at Melbourne. So there you um, go. Bring him in. Sign him up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, whether that's true or not, but yeah. Well, uh, fellas, is there anything else uh, you want to uh, bring up uh, before we uh, call it a, a day? Anything else? Uh, um, credit to Miles from Nowhere, who I thought came up with one of the lines of the week in the post-match discussion um, when he said, excellent performance by the Blues coach. The magician turned Liam Jones into nearly a footballer and has now turned him back into Liam Jones. Kudos. <laughs> I thought he's Liam Jones got a, quite a good grab on him, um, but yeah, <laughs> he took that great running mark that was ruined by his uh, teammate uh, giving away a free kick at the same time. Mm. Oh yes, uh, that was uh, Bailey. Was that the Bailey Fritch? Yes, yeah. yes. 
there was a, just that run in the first quarter where Carlton was just giving away these just ridiculous free kicks that just made you think there is no way we can possibly lose to this side. And there we were at the end of the quarter, only about a handful of points in front. But all's well that ends well. Yeah, and no, I, I look, I, I really, I really uh, like uh, Cripps, and I really hope that he wants to go back to uh, Western <laughs> Western Australia and uh, <laughs> and blow Frio's cap so that they <laughs> yeah. can't afford Hogan. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> All right, boys. Um, anything else uh, before I uh, play that beautiful music? I'm just looking forward to looking forward to the game this week. I think we'll really know where we're at uh, by this time next week. Yeah, I think so too. I'm predicting a six-goal win. Well, I, I like your uh, optimism. Um, yeah, Potentially I, more. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, I'm just I'm the 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 two games, you know, in that that middle part of the the first part of the season uh, coming back to haunt me, and I'm just hoping. Uh, and look, I know we didn't have McDonald then. Viney's back. Uh, teams a lot different to the, what it was then, um, but yeah, I, I have a bit of that MFC SS still inside of me, and um, yeah, I hope uh, hope we can away. crush that. Yeah, <laughs> we'll never go away. Chronic. <laughs> a, uh, a Premiership Cup might, uh, might soothe that, but uh, we're still a little little bit away from that. Um, uh, Super Mercado, you want to plug uh, any of your uh, wonderful? Um, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll give the usual triple header. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at DemonBlog, uh, on the blog at DemonBlog.com, and, uh, of course, DemonWiki.org for all your obscure statistical requirements. Oh, we can't let a, uh, a, a Super Mercado appearance uh, go without uh, me having a quick look at the uh, DemonWiki.org and um, <laughs> checking random out the, ra- of the day. Ra- <laughs> random player of the day. And... I always get one that uh, I can't uh, identify on site and uh, the image name isn't helping me on this uh, this time. Uh, it could be Stephen Armstrong. I don't know. Um, I've got Port Adelaide's own Don Barry. <laughs> Has he played this year, Don Barry? I think he's played pretty much every game. Has he? Oh, OK. Yeah, he certainly but he was in there in round one. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we, we won't even talk about Jack Watts um, and uh, comparisons with uh, Bailey Fritch uh, maybe next week. Uh, Great Viney, anything from you before we go out? Nope. Go nope. Demons. All right. Go Dees. All right. Uh, we'll see you uh, next week. Same time. Well, not same time. We'll probably be back on a Wednesday next week. Um, go Dees.